Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, uh, you should have all got the uh, invitation to my Zoom office hours. I know some people have already come to them, so at least some people got that. Um, it's, they're going to be uh, Monday from 11 to 12 and Tuesday from 2 to 3. Um, or by appointment. So if you can't make those times, let me know, and uh, and you want to meet, uh, let me know, and we can we can set something up. Um, okay, so there's just a couple things left over from last time that I wanted to talk about. It's mostly along the lines of. Um, do we actually still believe, well, I guess, did anyone ever believe? I don't know. But <laughs> at this point, are Hobbes' warnings about how bad it's going to be if we don't do what he says, are they um, believable? So, and I'm not really going to answer that, but I'm just going to raise the question. So one place it comes up is, when Hobbes says that the powers of the sovereign are inseparable. So the powers of the sovereign, I mean, in one sense, the sovereign has whatever powers they want, right? That is because the subjects are not allowed to complain. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so I guess when Hobbes makes a list of the powers of the sovereign, it's basically for the benefit of the sovereign. Like, if you're the sovereign, <laughs> what should you do? I guess. But, so, in any case, Hobbes says that uh, um, what you can't think of doing is splitting these powers among different people. Um, because if anyone has to depend on anyone else for any of them, then that's something that's going to inevitably bring about civil war. So, you know, he says this, um, like, I guess if you asked why well, think that's inevitable, so this is not his proof, of course. His proof is uh, not supposed to depend on experience, but it's just supposed to be from the contents of concepts or whatever. But I think what he says here is revealing. He mentions an example, the example that's on his mind, of course. If there had not first been an opinion received of the greatest part of England that these powers... were divided between the king and the lords and the house of commons. So, right, that is the opinion, that is a widespread opinion that the king had the right to command the army, but that the house of commons had the right to levy taxes, and the lords had the right to resolve uh, judicial disputes. So, um, if there had not been this opinion, the people had never been divided and fallen into this civil war first between those that disagreed in politics and after between the dissenters about the liberty of religion, blah, 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 etc. What blah, 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 etc. basically says is, and now I think the English people have learned their lesson. Of course, he was wrong about that, right? I mean, the, it was Locke who came out on top, basically, with the English people. Well, I mean... Did they learn their lesson in the long term? I mean, the UK now does not really have, diff you know, uh, separate branches of government. It has parliamentary sovereignty. Hmm. Well, be that as it may, <laughs> um, at least in the short term, the uh, British people did not, or the English people did not learn their lesson. But... Um, but also, I think, if you think about it more, so, um, um, well, you can ask either, 
Okay, how have divided governments done? By the yardstick that Hobbes is using, namely not falling into civil war. So, uh, well, we had one civil war in this country. It was 150 years ago. And since then, perhaps until now, there's been a tr peaceful transfer of power. <laughs> well, you know, um, that's actually really good by historical standards. I don't think the Roman Empire ever had 50 years of peaceful transfers of power, let alone 150. Um, so, in other words... The evidence of experience now seems to be against him. Also, if you think about what actually causes civil wars, I think I mentioned this before, in monarchies, I think most civil wars are wars of succession. Right? One person claims to be the heir to the crown, and someone else also claims to be the heir to the crown, which, as Hobbes himself mentions, is a problem in monarchies. Um, I mean, Hobbes does have a whole plan worked out so that the succession will always be clear, or almost always, unless the monarch who died had no known relatives, basically. Um, but, uh, but he at least admits that this is a weak point in the system. Well, in English history, at least, it read, led to lots of civil wars and in histories of other European countries. So, um, it almost seems as if perhaps when Hobbes claims to be doing science based on the contents of concepts, he's really just... Um, being prudent, that is, applying the, cont the lessons of his own experience with the English Civil War and, like, assuming that they always hold for everything. Um, I guess there's um, a few other passages that um, are more along the lines of did Hobbes really realize how bad a commonwealth could get? <laughs> um, so um, Like, for example, here's something, uh, uh, chapter 18, paragraph 20, page 117. Um, Okay, the, the greatest pressure, by pressure he means oppression, what we would call oppression. The greatest pressure of sovereign governors proceedeth not from any delight or profit they can expect in the damage or weakening of their subjects, in whose vigor consisteth their own strength and glory, but in the restiveness of themselves that, unwillingly contributing to their own defense, make it necessary for their governors to draw from them what they can in time of peace, that they may have means on any emergent occasion or sudden need to resist or take advantage on their enemies. Right, so Hobbes is saying, like, the reason um, sovereigns start to oppress the people and the oppression he's thinking about is levying taxes that are too heavy. So he's saying that the reason they do that is not because they want to harm their people. After all, their own, you know, 
he says at some point, monarchs at least have the exact same interest as their subjects. They can only become strong and powerful and rich if their subjects are. Right? So it's not because of that. That wouldn't make sense. It's because they know that if a war comes, they might have trouble raising money on the spot. And so they have to start planning in advance and always taxing people more to save up for a rainy day, basically. Well, I mean, again, that's some kind of at least contestable interpretation of England in the 17th century. But if you think about why um, sovereigns or governments oppress their subjects, um, and how they oppress their subjects. Well, uh, um, you know, um, why did, well, I guess just put it this way. We can think of a lot of examples of governments in the 20th century who oppressed their subjects or some of their subjects terribly, um, why? Certainly not because of some la rational plan like this to save up for a rainy day, right? I mean, many times in ways that did undermine their own power um, and wealth and so forth. Um, um, and uh, when you take that kind of, that kind of thing into accounts, it's not necessarily clear that we should regard every commonwealth as better than the state of nature. Um, I don't know. That's, maybe I shouldn't have talked about this at all. After all, what do I know about this? I'm not a historian of 20th century <laughs> oppressive governments or anything. But it is, I guess, I, I mean, it is worth asking the question, uh, is, are there merely like factual errors in Hobbes' argument, basically, um, that he says or assumes that people will only start civil wars for certain reasons or that governments will only do certain bad things for certain kinds of rational reasons, but the truth is we now know better, and maybe even he should have known better. Well, someone says, interestingly enough, many OECD nations are some form of monarchy. Well, some form of monarchy, right? But like, um, um, so uh, like I said, for example, in the, in the United Kingdom, there's no question, first of all, that um, the Queen can't appoint any ministers unless they have the support of Parliament, and that means that in fact, that in effect, the person who's the real head of the executive is responsible to Parliament and can only govern as long as they have a majority there. So um, that is the prime minister, right? So. Uh, um, yeah, what form of monarchy is that? Uh, you know, I think Hobbes would say, well, it's not a monarchy. <laughs> um, yeah, how many OECD nations are actual monarchies? Constitutional monarchy? Yeah, but it's, I mean, there was a time, where, like, I don't know, we're getting into, again, we're getting into things that are be, probably outside my, whatever my area, my area of non-expertise, well, whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think there was a time when the United Kingdom was a constitutional monarchy. That is, the king had certain powers, the Parliament, House of Commons had certain powers, the House of Lords had certain powers. They, you know, there was an unwritten constitution that limited everyone's powers and whatever. But, uh, you know, it later became clear that the Parliament, that is, the House of Commons, um, basically that all sovereignty is centered there. So if they passed a bill tomorrow saying that it's a republic, I mean, they already did basically eliminate the House of Lords. 
I mean, there's still a House of Lords, but it, the Lords aren't in it anymore, <laughs> right? So um, there's people who are called Lords, but they're not the uh, they're not the hereditary nobility, um, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think at this point to call it a constitutional monarchy is overstating the case. It is, it's a monarchy in some sense, but and maybe even in an important sense, but not in a sense that Hobbes would be interested in. The, the monarch doesn't have any power. So, well, would he be interested in it? Only in a negative sense, I think. You know, he would say that the people are being taught a false mythology or something about who rules them. And it will only lead to trouble in the end, is probably what he would say. Okay, are there any other questions about that? All right, so now I'm going to go on to some material from this week. Now, the material from this week is uh, kind of a mixed bag of different things. There's... Uh, Quite a few important things. There's four that I want to talk about, but I'm not even sure that I'll be able to, to do justice to those four, but um, here they are. The first one is um, paternal dominion. And the second one is propriety of speech. Keep going back and forth on whether I should try to do this one or not. But anyway, we'll see when I get to it. And the third one, I guess I would call um, subordinate structures of government. This really includes two different things, although I think overlapping things. Number one, public ministers. And number two, what Hobbes calls bodies politic. The bodies politic basically means um, uh, corporations authorized by the Commonwealth. Right? You know the word corporation means, like corpus means body, right? So a corporation is a like embodiment that is um, making of a fictitious body a legal body. So um, so Hobbes is just using the English word for that instead of the Latin word when he calls them bodies politic. Um, and then the fourth one is, I guess I would say, economics and equity. Right, because in, in this reading, Hobbes, I think, gives his fullest discussion of um, property rights and uh, rights and duties of the sovereign to economic regulation. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about this one first. I think the reason this one is kind of a question, these three are things that Hobbes more or less dis, 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 you know, announces as topics of chapters or parts of chapters. This is, some, is an issue that kind of runs throughout Hobbes, um, and, but it kind of comes up especially with respect to some of the things he says in this reading, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get to it. Maybe that means I should put it last. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to talk about paternal power first and see what time it is when I finish that. All right. So, um, so paternal dominion, Hobbes discuss, discusses under the general heading of Commonwealth by Acquisition, which um, I already talked about quite a bit before, what Commonwealth by Acquisition is. Um, and how it's related to Commonwealth by institution. This is, you know, it was uh, in this chapter, I guess, uh, 
20, um, where, where Hobbes actually uh, discusses it explicitly, but what he says about it basically is that the rights of the sovereign by acquisition are the same as the rights of the sovereign by institution. And if, you, if you're confused about what acquisition means, just think of it as meaning conquest. That's what acquisition means in this context. So anyway, but under, so I'm not going to talk more about that, but under that heading, he talks about paternal dominion. That is the right of dominion by generation, as he puts it. Right, generation meaning like, you know, reproduction, basically. The right of that that someone gets to um, command someone else because of reproductively generating them, and um, this is an important topic in its own right. Um, it's also not. I mean. Not every case of it, or almost any case of it, is really a case of commonwealth by acquisition. I'll say why in a second. But, but, but it's also important in its own right um, for a lot of reasons. And we're going to see Locke and Rousseau and Wollstonecraft all come back to this issue of um, um, the power of parents over children. Okay, but so it turns out right away, and this is a point that Locke is also going to make. So when Locke makes this point, he's not arguing against Hobbes, um, at least not as far as this goes. So it turns out that um, parental, paternal dominion, first of all, um, is, right, so this is supposed to be by generation. It's, it's a kind of commonwealth by acquisition. Be, I mean, in this case, you don't really conquer the other person. You just, like, they're in your power to begin with because they're your child. And so, um, so Hobbes says, oh, this is the kind of dominion someone gets by generation. But it turns out pretty quickly that, first of all, it's not really paternal. And second of all, it's not really by generation. <laughs> And for the, both for the same reason, namely that as Hobbes doesn't at all forget, there are two parents, right? Only one is the paternal parent. The other is the maternal parent. <laughs> so, um, um, so first of all, that means that um, whatever dominion belongs to the father or the mother can't be just by virtue of being a parent of the child. Why not? Because they would both have to have it since they're both parents of the child, but Hobbes doesn't think that they could both have dominion over the child. Um, Right, as he says, this is in chapter 20, paragraph 4 on page 128. The dominion, therefore, over the child should belong equally to both, and he be equally subject to both, which is impossible, for no man can obey two masters. So, um, um, I mean, there's a couple things you can see from this. First of all, you know, this paternal, but it turns out, again, that it's really not paternal. Um, that it could be maternal. So this paternal or maternal dominion is, is very much like the dominion of a sovereign in a commonwealth. And because it's very much like the dominion of a sovereign in a commonwealth, it can't be split between different parties. Right? Like, I mean, you know, if the father and the mother both have this kind of 
um, dominion or sovereignty over the child. What happens when they disagree with each other? Who will decide it? And the answer is there's no one to decide it. They'll have to fight each other. And that's, that's not dominion. So if there's going to be dominion, it will have to go to one or the other one. Um, and Hobbes actually says, so you might ask, well, okay, why are you calling it paternal dominion? Do you think that because it has to go to one or the other one, because the male sex is stronger or something like that, therefore it will go to the father? And um, Hobbes says, no, <laughs> right? Uh, um, he says, first of all, this is in the same paragraph I was just reading on page 128. Um, there is not always that difference of strength or prudence between the man and the woman, as that the right can be determined without war. Right, so he's not denying that perhaps, um, you know, on average, uh, men are stronger than women, um, but he is saying, well, remember what he said before about quote unquote, men in the state of nature. Now, by the way, I should mention that, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a Latin version of Leviathan, which was published after the English version. There's a Latin translation of Leviathan because a lot of people, Latin was still the la one of the main languages of learning in Europe. A lot of people couldn't read English, but could read Latin. So there was a Latin translation of Leviathan. In, in this edition, at least, there's, uh, there are footnotes um, sometimes saying what the Latin edition says, if it's interestingly different from the English one. So anyway, almost everywhere where it says man in this book, the Latin translation is homo, which uh, doesn't mean man as opposed to woman, right? There's no feminine correlate to homo. It means human being. Um, but in, in that one paragraph that I just read, where it says there is not always that difference of strength between man and woman, in the Latin, there it says mas, which means someone male, like as in masculine. So um, in Latin, but not in English, uh, and, you know, because English has this weird, tricky, ambiguous word, um, Hobbes doesn't have to make it clear where he's thinking about men versus women and where he's not. But in Latin, he does have to make it clear, and he makes it clear that he's usually not. <laughs> um, and when he is here, what he's saying is um, the same thing he said about human beings in general in the state of nature, right? Namely, that although, of course, some are stronger than others, the weakest is strong enough to kill the strongest, either by deceit or by teaming up with others or whatever, right? Um, and remember, he said the same is even more true of prudence or the kind of wisdom you get from experience. Oh, someone just asked, so this wouldn't apply for adopted kids. I don't know when you asked that. But actually, I mean, what's, what's the way Hobbes ends up explaining it, it would apply to adopted children. Because, again, it turns out that generation is not really the essence of it. If it were, the man and the woman would have to both share it. Or one gender would have to be so much stronger than the other that um, it would just clearly be a losing proposition for one to fight with the other, right? So, but that's, that's what Hobbes is denying in that passage I just read. 
at least it seems like he is, it's a little bit ambiguous. He says there is not always that difference of strength or prudence. Does that mean sometimes there is? But, but my feeling is when you compare it to the other passage where he talks about the equality of all men in the state of nature, and again, there man is homo, I think he's just, when he says there is not always, he means like, um, it's never a rule you can count on. That is, it's not always, and you are and you always have to think this might be one of the exceptions, right? So, like, in other words, if, if you're the man and you're thinking men are stronger than women, I can do what I want and I don't have to worry about being killed by the woman in the state of nature, um, Hobbes is saying, well, be careful. There isn't always that difference. And this might be one of the times when there isn't, <laughs> right? So that means that, you know, uh, rationally speaking, one doesn't have more right than the other in this situation. Meaning one isn't fear, free from fear of the other. So, um, okay, so where does this dominion come from? And especially, where does it come from in the state of nature? So, um, it's by acquisition or by conquest. That is, it's because the child finds itself in the power of the adult. Um, at a time when it's unable to fight for itself. So in order to survive, it has to recognize the dominion of the adult. Now, why that persists when it grows up, like why it should be bound by a covenant it made when it was a child, Hobbes doesn't really explain. It's not clear. Um, but uh, because in general, he says children uh, are not subject to law and are not able to make covenants. Um, because they're because they're not considered to be capable of foreseeing the consequences of breaking the covenant. Therefore, they can't be relied on to keep the covenant. Therefore, there is no covenant. Um, that is, they haven't laid down any rights. But be that as it may, so I guess the point is that the child like remains in the power of the parent until it's too late or something like that. Um, I guess maybe also the point is that if there's more than one child, they will, as they get older, they won't be as afraid of the parent, but they'll come to be afraid of being in the state of nature and therefore they'll continue to obey the parent. And in that way, the family will come to be like a small commonwealth. So what determines which parent it is, though? And Hobbes says, well, uh, the parents could make a contract with each other. So they can say, all right, here's this infant. It's in both of our power, but that's not doing us any good because, you know, we're just going to fight about it. So here's the deal. I'll let you be have dominion over the child and in return, and we don't know what they're giving in return, but I guess it could be anything, I guess. Although then again, what could it be in the state of nature? The question. I don't know, he doesn't make that clear. See, this is really important, and it's especially important because of what I'm about to say next, which is that he says, okay, so what if there is no contract? And the answer is, if there be no contract, the dominion is in the mother. And he has an interesting explanation of that. Um, but so first of all, far from saying because of some natural difference between the sexes, 
even though you know you can imagine them splitting the dominion it's going to go to the man Hobbes is saying no in the state of nature there's a natural difference between the sexes such that it, it goes to the woman unless they made other arrangements why does it go to the woman well he gives two reasons the first reason he says is that only the woman knows who the father is that's pretty conclusive right he says in the state of nature they don't have a uh, marriage. Um, uh, there's no uh, laws to keep people monogamous. So we don't really have that now either. But in Hobbes' time, they did. I mean, I guess adultery is still illegal, but state doesn't mostly get involved in that now but anyway be that as it may so um uh so Hobbes is saying in the state of nature no one knows who the father is except the mother so they have to take her word for it <laughs> so uh um so if she wants to claim dominion it's hers And the second reason, he says, is because the, it's the mother who has to decide whether to nurse the infant or not. If she doesn't nurse the infant, the infant will die, and there's nothing the father can do about it. Therefore, the infant is in the mother's power, not in the father's power. So those are, those are two different explanations, both based on, like, uh, not a difference in strength or prudence, but actual, you know, biological difference between the two parents. That one is the parent that carries the child and gives birth to it, so there's no question who the mother is, right? And also, that happens to also be the same one who uh, produces milk. So therefore, Hobbes says, in the state of nature, the dominion naturally goes to the mother. Now, I mean, this makes this question uh, like all the more pressing. So why is it called paternal dominion, Hobbes? Why not call it maternal dominion? And uh, be behind that question of what to call it, there's also this question. So how come there's so many patriarchal societies? Uh... Um, right? How come not only in England in the 17th century, but in a lot of different places and times, people would have said, oh yeah, the, the dominion goes to the father. That's, I mean, that's why, that's why he's calling it paternal dominion, because that's how people think of it. But the question is why? Why do people think of it that way? If you're right, and the mother has dominion in the state of nature, unless there's special arrangements. So you have to explain... Oh, by the way, I never got back to the question about adopted kids, but Hobbes actually mentions this as a case in point. He says, suppose the mother decides not to nurse the infant, but someone else picks it up and nourishes it. He says, well, in that case, that person has dominion. Right? So adopted kids who are abandoned and nourished by someone else are, you know, again, generation really has nothing to do with it. It's being in the power of someone when you're helpless as a child. That's what creates this dominion. Um, sorry. So what would I? What was I saying? Oh, right. So, um, so, so the question is, like, if you're right, Hobbes, that in the state of nature, dominion belongs to the mother unless there's special arrangements. You either have to explain why there's almost always going to be special arrangements, but he doesn't. He doesn't even say what doesn't even give an example of what these arrangements would be. Um, or, um, if not, you're going to have to explain why in the transition from the state of nature to a civil state, somehow the roles got flipped. If not absolutely always, then a lot. Right? I mean, um, um, it's not just, it's often enough that it can't just be a weird fluke. But Hobbes doesn't give a very good explanation for that at all. Um, I 
just says, didn't I write down where this is? Hmm. Oh yeah, here it is. It's in that same paragraph on the next page. One tw I mean, sorry, it's chapter 20, paragraph, back in paragraph 4 on page 129. Well, it starts in the bottom of page 128. In Commonwealth, this controversy is decided by the civil law. And for the most part, but not always, the sentence is in favor of the father. Now, why? So, I mean, you might expect, again, some kind of natural biological explanation, something like that. No, this is what he says. Because for the most part, commonwealths have been erected by the fathers, not by the mothers of families. So, I mean, you know, First of all, he's, he's suggesting that patriarchal societies are patriarchal in a pretty strong sense, that it's, they're actually, it is, was a kind of conspiracy of the men, you know, right? Like those are the men who formed the Commonwealth, and since it was the men who formed the Commonwealth, um, the... Um, uh, they decided to put themselves in charge. But, uh, but, it's, but this is also a weird explanation because it doesn't explain why, for the most part, it's the fathers of families that form commonwealths. I mean, it seems to have just pushed the question one step back. Right? If it's really that the mother normally would have dominion in the, right of, in the state of nature, why is it that the fathers were the ones who formed commonwealths? Um, it's possibly, he does say at some point in explaining why um, uh, uh, except in like emergencies, women are not usually pressed into military service. He says it's because of the timorous nature of that sex. He doesn't mention anything about that here. It's possible he's thinking something like the women wouldn't dare to do this. Um, uh, only the men would be brave enough or arrogant enough or something to, to hatch this plan and carry it out. Um, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's kind of a mystery, but it's obviously, it's a very important mystery, especially when we go on to Wollstonecraft, you know, and start asking, uh, like, start talking about all the problems that have been caused by this type of society that Hobbes does not really seem to be able to explain why we have it. According to his principles, it almost seems like we shouldn't. Um, okay, I guess I should mention one other thing about paternal dominion before I go on. So paternal dominion, I keep kind of dancing around this issue, but it's like sovereignty. So I think what Hobbes says about it precisely is that it is sovereignty if the family is big enough to deter invaders. Right? So remember, a commonwealth has to be a certain size to really function as a commonwealth, because if it's smaller than that, then the enemies will say, oh, I see, they have five people, I just get seven and I can beat them, right? But if the commonwealth is big enough, then it's really hard to tell how many people you need to beat them, and so there's a, like a general deterrence of invasions. That's at least the way Hobbes explains it. So, uh, you know, what he's, the, the, the only thing that prevents a family, a family could include um, a parent and children. It could also include a master and what we would call slaves. But Hobbes reserves the term slave for people who are literally in chains. He calls these people servants. But they're what we would call slaves. They're under the absolute dominion of their master. 
So a family could also include slaves in addition to children. Um, and, uh, you know, the head of the family has absolute power over them insofar as they can keep it up. But since they're pretty vulnerable to outside attack, there's going to be constant situations where a member of the family will say, well, I'm kind of afraid of the head of the family, but I'm more afraid of these invaders, so I'm going to go over to them. Um, and so um, uh, because of that, a family that's too small doesn't really count as a commonwealth. However, it is a kind of political unit, and that, that story about the fathers of families starting the commonwealth seems to indicate um, first of all, that it was really families that formed commonwealths, not individuals. And secondly, that for that reason, the commonwealth is set up to still consist of families rather than individuals after it's been started. So um, um, that was part of the plan of the fathers, that um, we're going to give up some of the powers of our family for protection but anything that the sovereign, so that means we're going to appoint a sovereign, but anything, any power that sovereign doesn't take within our families, we're still going to exercise, only now with a civil law behind us. So it's like a great deal, basically. Right? Saying, you know, yeah, I mean, in theory, the sovereign can come in and mess with stuff in your family, but usually they won't. So, um, but on the other hand, if the people in your family start saying, I'd rather go belong to another family, you can say, you can call on the civil law to enforce your authority. That's basically the picture that Hobbes paints. Um, okay, and again, I, I go into that part, especially because we'll see how different Locke's picture of the status of families within a commonwealth is. Um, okay, are there questions about that? And yeah, I'm really sorry someone had trouble getting in. I don't know why. Questions? Uh, so when Hobbes is talking about sovereignty, dominion and sovereignty are completely different things because families only have one sovereign or any, everyone only has one sovereign, but every family has a parental dominion. Yeah, it's a little bit, I don't, they're not completely different things. <laughs> they're like overlapping things, right? I mean, the sovereignty is dominion. So, and it's, um, basically despotical dominion, the kind of master has over slaves, according to Hobbes. So, um, so sovereignty is dominion. On the other hand, in the state of nature, there's dominion that's absolute, but is not sovereignty because it can't defend itself. That's what I was just talking about, about families that are too small. Um, which presumably is most families in the state of nature. I'm not, I'm not sure what he thinks about that. But, um, and on the other hand, yeah, he's willing to use the, the term dominion for this kind of relative or limited dominion that the, the heads of families retain within a commonwealth. Whereas obviously he wouldn't say they have sovereignty. So, yeah, so they're not... Like I said, they're not completely different, they, but, but they, they overlap, but they also, there's dominion without sovereignty. There's no sovereignty without dominion, I guess. Sovereignty is a form of dominion. It's dominion that doesn't have any other dominion over it and that is over enough people to constitute a commonwealth. Okay, that was a good question. Are there other questions? What time is it now? Hmm. All right. I'm going to take a risk and talk about this propriety of speech thing. It's something that I find really interesting. It's like probably not something that occurred to you as you were going through the reading. 
Now I'm writing propriety of speech. So Hobbes, um, we have two words, property and propriety. Wait, I don't even remember whether they corrected it in here. Well, yeah, they spit. They did not. They did not correct the spelling. So, right, we have two words, property and propriety, but Hobbes spells both of them this way, and I guess pronounces them the same too. In other words, Hobbes only has one word, but we have two words. Um, but you know, when he talks about propriety of land or propriety of, um. Uh, office or something like that, then we mentally translate that as property, whereas when he talks about propriety of speech, we think, oh, that's something different. Um, but, I mean, when you think about it, propriety of speech, you have the same type of question. It's out of focus. You have the same kind of question, right? Like in, so to speak, a state of nature, a state of talking nature, I can make whatever sound I want and it can mean whatever I want. <laughs> so by what authority does some use of words become proper and other uses become improper? Um, Right? Or in other words, if a word has a proper meaning, then I somehow am doing something wrong when I use it improperly. And moreover, this, um, this kind of property or propriety, which involves some kind of constraint on my ability to use words in certain ways. So it provides some kind of constraint on my right to use certain words in certain ways, so to speak. But as usual with Hobbes, that would eventually come down to, like, if I'm reasonable, I won't want to use them the wrong way. And we can see why in this case, because I won't be understood. Right? So it's... Um, um, so there's a kind of um, um, compact or agreement of some kind between the users of a language to use words in certain ways, and they're doing it for the ends of language. Right? So just like in the Commonwealth, we have an end of Commonwealth, namely to seek peace. And then from that, you can deduce the, you know, what kind of uh, covenant or compact is going to be necessary, like what the articles of peace will have to be. So similarly, in this case, um, we have language for certain reasons. And from that, you can gather what certain articles of this uh, um, artificial boundary that we set for each other have to be. So what is the end of language? Um, Hobbes actually lists a bunch of ends of language in chapter 4, paragraph 3. Um, I won't read it, but it's basically what you might expect. You know, it's to keep track of your own thoughts. 
For that, of course, I don't need a covenant with anyone else, although I need a kind of covenant with myself, so to speak. But anyway, to keep track of your own thoughts, um, to communicate them to others, um, to reason, counsel, request, command, entertain, right? Those are all things that we want language to do. So it seems that when Hobbes criticizes um, us for using words improperly um, or for having a bad kind of language, he means that the, um, the covenant we've actually created is not necessarily well suited to those ends of language. Right, just as he will criticize a commonwealth that's not set up the right way, that doesn't have a you know sovereignty clearly situated in one person, for example, uh, so um, he'll criticize it because he'll say, no, that's you can't set it up that way. Meaning that if you set it up that way, you're undermining the aim of peace for. Um, for which we we are entering this covenant to begin with. Um, right, so here's an example of where he says something like this. This is on page 165 in uh, beginning of chapter 25. How fallacious it is to judge of the nature of things by the ordinary and inconstant use of words appeareth in nothing more than the confusion of counsels and commands arising from the imperative manner of speaking in them both and in many other occasions beside. Right, so what he's saying here is that um, our language in which do this can be a command or can be advice um, is uh, unsuited for judging, that is, for reasoning about the nature of things. We are tempted to draw false conclusions because we're tempted to mix up commands and counsels. There's already a bit of a question here about Hobbes. I'm going to, I think, raise a more serious question of, of another example. But remember that the laws of nature, Hobbes states them in the imperative, or at least the first one, seek peace. He states in the imperative. And then he goes on to, to list them and to say that they're laws and that they bind in foro interno, et cetera, et cetera. But um, all of a sudden, towards the very end, he tells you, they're not really laws, but they're just good counsel. So the very confusion that he's complaining about in the beginning of chapter 25, he seems to have done himself his best to engender himself in chapter whatever that was, 14 and 15, I think, about the laws of nature. So... Um, Another way of putting that would be to say that it's not clear that Hobbes hopes or intends that all his readers will reason justly based on what he says. He may have put some things to throw some readers off the track. You know, pay careful attention. Um, be that as it may, um, um, this, um, all these needs, all these ends of language that establish how, what a language should be like, um, let's say what things it should have the same word for and what things it should have different words for or different forms of speech, as in the case where he's complaining about the imperative. Um, how are those ends related to the end of seeking peace? 
Well, um, I mean, it's not obvious that all of them are completely in line with the overall end of Seeking Peace. Um, you know, uh, entertaining, um, communicating, communicating your thoughts, I guess that sounds like maybe it's always on the good side. Um, reasoning, he thinks is always on the good side. I guess most of them, maybe if you think about it, really would kind of tend to line up with the end of seeking peace. But uh, um, Hobbes seems to think something stronger than that. He seems to think that um, all these ends are strictly subordinate to the to the um, ultimate end of seeking peace, which is the law of nature. So, I mean, we should only want any of these things insofar as they uh, lead to peace. And I think uh, he makes that point. This is uh, chapter 18, paragraph 9 on page 113. where he says something that otherwise might appear very questionable. I think I mentioned this before, before. And though in matter of doctrine, nothing ought to be regarded but the truth. So this is in the context of him saying the sovereign has the power of deciding what doctrines can be maintained in the commonwealth and what doctrines are illegal. Right. And he anticipates that you might reply, you know, look, in matters of doctrine, we shouldn't worry about what's good for a commonwealth or not. We should be going for the truth. So uh, interestingly, he doesn't deny that. He concedes that. And though in matter of doctrine, nothing ought to be regarded but the truth. Yet this is not repugnant to regulating of the same by peace, that is, regulating doctrine by peace. For doctrine repugnant to peace can no more be true than peace and concord can be against the law of nature. So, like I said, that on the face of it seems pretty questionable. Why couldn't it be that there's certain truths that uh, are that if people knew them would tend to undermine commonwealths. So they're true, but it's against the in, our interest for people to know them. Um, so as Hume says in a similar connection, you know, if people can't refute them, they'll at least be sure to consign them to 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 oblivion. He uses a more colorful phrase. I forget what it is. But anyway, they'll at least, you know, if people can't figure out how to refute them, they'll at least ensure that no one remembers them <laughs> if there's that kind of dangerous truth. So um, um, Hobbes is saying there couldn't be. How could that be? And... Um, I think the answer is that um, that reasoning will always, that leads to that truth, will always involve an improper use of words. I mean, I may be reading a lot in here, but it feels like that, that may be how it comes out if you put all the pieces together, right? So... I mean, remember, Hobbes says to begin with that reason is just about drawing the consequences of definitions. Then he says, therefore, it's important to start with the right definitions. And you ask, how can a definition be wrong? You should ask when he says that. What do you mean, the right definitions? I can define it however I want and then draw the consequences from it. So I think the reason a definition can be wrong is because if you make that definition, you might draw, you can use it to draw conclusions that are contrary to peace. 
Therefore, that would be an improper use of words. I think that's what he means. So, I mean, first of all, that means that the sense in which there can't be such truths is kind of tricky. It's that, you know, there shouldn't be a valid trains of reasoning that lead you to express such truths. It should be impossible to say them, <laughs> is what he really means. And second of all, it, you know, maybe throws some light on what the rare talent that Hobbes thinks he has that makes him a man of science. What is the rare talent? Um, maybe the rare talent is to figure out how things have to be defined to get the answer that will lead to peace. Right? That is to make sure that you start with the right definitions. I mean, it would certainly, that would certainly line up with what it looks like Hobbes is spending a lot of energy on in this book, if that's what he's trying to do. Um, now, that was a lot of, um, I don't know, kind of conjecture um, relating reading between the lines, things that Hobbes doesn't exactly talk about, but that um, if you compare Hobbes to other people, it might start to seem like he must have a position on them, stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's all complicated by what he says about liberty in today's reading. Um, so... Um, I mean, I guess when I say it's complicated, I don't think that if you think about the case of the word liberty long enough, um, it can't be consistent with what I just said. But first of all, at first it seems like it goes against it because Hobbes says, remember that the proper sense of liberty I'm not going to go back to the details of where he says this. And this is in chapter 21 because uh, I already talked about them before when I introduced liberty way back when in chapter 6 or wherever that was. Right? But remember that the proper sense of liberty is um, the freedom of a body to move in a certain way, which uh, that is the absence of impediments to motion and impediments to motion can only be bodies. So the freedom of a body means the absence of other bodies that will, pre that, that would prevent it from moving in a certain way. So when you apply it to human beings, it means the absence of things like chains and walls and cages and so forth that will uh, prevent our body from moving in a certain way. There are other bodies that we can't push out of the way, so we can't get past them. Um, uh, but then remember, there's also an, it doesn't call it an improper sense, but if this is the proper sense, then this must be an improper sense. There's an improper sense of liberty, which corresponds to an improper sense of impediment, where I call, um, where I say that there's an impediment to my doing a certain thing if rationally I should be afraid to do it. Right? And we create impediments of that kind in uh, creating commonwealths. I guess that's not the only place you could talk about impediments of that kind, but uh, like this, the situation he mentions where your boat is, you know, in a storm and you're throwing stuff over to prevent it from sinking. So he says, you know, that's, you're at liberty not to do it. Nothing's forcing you to do it. Meaning no body is pushing you and making you do it. 
but are you really at liberty not to do it? Well, in this improper sense of liberty, you're not, because if you're rational, you'll be af so afraid of sinking that you definitely will throw the stuff overboard. But anyway, he doesn't give examples of using this improper sense other than in a commonwealth. But there, when he talks about the liberty of subjects, it's all about that. Right? Subjects have certain liberties within a commonwealth, and they're deprived of other liberties. But that doesn't mean that they're in chains. Um, right? So this I will look at. This is uh, chapter 21, paragraph 6, on page 138. Um, so at the beginning he's, of this paragraph, he says, and when I talk about the liberty of subjects, I'm only talking about these quote-unquote bonds, these artificial chains, that is, these improper impediments, these things that don't really force you to do something, but, act, but just make you afraid not to, etc. So he says... Um, you know, when I talk about liberty of subjects, that's what I'm talking about. For if we take liberty in the proper sense, for corporal liberty, that is to say, freedom from chains and prison, it were very absurd for men to clamor as they do for the liberty they so manifestly enjoy. Right? So people going around saying, hey, subjects in this commonwealth don't have enough liberty. We need more liberty. Hobbes says, they obviously don't mean that they're in chains and they can't move. <laughs> they're clearly not. They're walking around, they're protesting, whatever. They mean that, you know, there's laws that prevent us from doing what we want to because we're afraid to violate the laws because we expect to be punished. And we want those laws eliminated so we can do that without being afraid of punishment. So whenever, so in the whole ch of chapter 21, when he talks about the liberty of subjects, he's always using the improper sense. Um, so why use the improper sense? Well, I guess as far as Hobbes himself goes, you can say, well, he has to use the improper sense to explain why um, people are wrong to think there's more liberty in a democracy than in a monarchy and so on and so forth. Um, that is, in order to answer the um, objections that have actually been made, um, that suggests that, uh, you know, you may not always be able to use words properly because you're stuck in a language that doesn't. Um, just as you may be stuck in the wrong kind of commonwealth and you're not at liberty to change it. Um, but uh, as far as how this improper use came about in the first place, um, So um, the explanation he gives um, at first in chapter 21 makes it sound like it was a kind of mistake by people who didn't have science. Um, it was a confusion. Um, it is an easy thing for men to be deceived by the, sp by the specious name of liberty. Specious means like um, appealing in this century. <laughs> it's, it means it appears good. Um, so um, Aristotle, Cicero, and other men, Greeks and Romans, that living under popular states derived those rights not from the principles of nature, but transcribed them into their books out of the practices of their own commonwealths, which were popular, that is, 
um, that is, were democracies. As the grammarians described the rules of language out of the practice of the time, or the rules of poetry out of the poems of Homer and Virgil. Why am I showing you my notes rather than the book? I, <laughs> oh well, whatever. <laughs> That's what I just did. It says the same thing as the book. Um, so um, that is, I left I left out maybe the too many words to make sense of the quote. But what he's saying is, it's easy for people to be mixed up about liberty because they read about liberty in the books written by Aristotle and Cicero. And Aristotle and Cicero were living in democracies, and so and and they didn't have enough science to understand where liberty really derives from and so forth and what different kinds uses of the word there are. And so instead they just um uh um called liberty the kind of rights that they had in the state that they lived in like the right to vote in the assembly of the people. And later people, relying on their authority, even though they lived under quite different kinds of commonwealths, you know, didn't understand that liberty in their commonwealth would be different. So like I said, that sounds like a mistake. But when he talks about it later, um... Well, this is actually, I shouldn't have said that. This is actually earlier. <laughs> when he talks about it in another place, in chapter 18, paragraph 4, he says, um, yeah, yeah. That men see not the reason to be alike in a monarchy and in a popular government proceedeth from the ambition of some that are kinder to the government of an assembly, whereof they may hope to participate, than of monarchy which they despair to enjoy. So assuming, and I think it's justified by the context there, assuming that one of the ways that people are trying to... Um, not see the reason or conceal the reason. Remember, again, reasoning is reasoning from definitions of words, is to use liberty in a confusing, inconsistent way. Um, um, but the reason they're doing it is not out of an honest mistake, but out of a secret desire to bring about a certain form of government, namely one that they hope to have participated in. Right? So I'm living in a monarchy. I'm like, I'm never going to be the monarch. But if we can change this to a democracy, um, I can be part of the assembly. And then presumably I'm thinking, furthermore, um, either like, and I'll like that because it will appeal to my vanity or whatever, or, and I can use that to my advantage. Like I can use my oratorical skills to become famous and wealthy and whatever. Um, so there it seems like a deliberate abuse of the word, a deliberate introduction of an improper sense might be involved. But he also says, and this is back in the paragraph I first read, um, chapter 21, paragraph 9 on page 140, And because the Athenians were taught to keep them from desire of changing their government, that they were free men and all that lived under monarchy was slaves. Therefore, Aristotle puts it down in his politics, in democracy, liberty is to be supposed for it is commonly held that, a man, that no man is free in any other government. So here it sounds like, and this is the main point I wanted to get to, I guess, about the proper versus improper use of liberty and perhaps other words, that Aristotle is actually doing something really smart. 
according to Hobbes. Since the Athenians live in a democracy, um, and Aristotle doesn't want them to try to change their form of government, which would lead to civil war. It actually did lead to civil war in Athens. <laughs> right? There was an oligarchy and democracy came back, whatever. Um, so since Aristotle wants to prevent that, he wants to teach them a use of liberty that will make them think that only they have liberty and people in a monarchy or an oligarchy don't. So that suggests that what is the proper sense might depend on the circumstances you find yourself in. Um, that, you know, um, uh, if you're talking to people in a democracy, then you and you understand how bad the state of nature is, then you want to use the words one way to make it look like they shouldn't want to change their, their form of government to anything else. But if you're living in a monarchy, as Hobbes is, and you're talking to people in a monarchy, at least he still thinks of himself as, as um, living in a monarchy, or the monarchy is the best bet of, of a government that could end the civil war, so if you're talking to people in an actual or potential monarchy and you want to convince them that a monarchy is better, then you're going to adjust the use of your words differently. And it's pretty clear that Hobbes is not talking to people in democracy because he actually at some point spends a whole chapter, I think that was chapter uh, 19, um, just explaining why monarchy is the best form of commonwealth. You wouldn't want to say, publish a book that said that in a democracy, presumably. Um, and if you say, right, that is, I mean, the, the assembly, according to Hobbes, should outlaw that book in a democracy. Right? It's, it's important for all of these people to realize that democracy doesn't mean, you know, the Bill of Rights or something like that. Democracy means everyone gets together and votes and that's the sovereign and has absolute power. So, um, right, so Hobbes thinks that a, a, the assembly in a democracy has the same duty and power to regulate speech as a monarch has in a monarchy. And presumably the one way they would exercise that power is by not letting Hobbes publish this book. Because <laughs> it's seditious, right? It claims that monarchy is better. So it's true, it says if you're in a democracy, you shouldn't try to change it. But, you know, I mean, it's still too dangerous, presumably, to allow him to say, yeah, monarchy is much better, but don't try to change. <laughs> so, um, um, so in a democracy, it would be illegal to say this, and it would be, and if you say, wait, shouldn't we only regard truth in doctrine, in matters of doctrine, Hobbes's response would be, well, but, um, no doctrine repugnant to truth can, uh, peace can be true. And then that will make sense if we say, okay, if Hobbes was living in a democracy, he would define his terms differently so that the reasoning came out differently. Okay, that's all I have to say about this. By the way, this was number two. Um, I'm still not sure I should have talked about that. I feel like you're probably thinking this, you know, this is not what I was thinking about when I did the reading. Uh, this is not what I ordered <laughs> in this lecture, <laughs> something like that. But, um, but it's connected to some very important issues that continue both before and after this in the history of philosophy. And it's interesting to, to, to guess what Hobbes is thinking about them. And based on this, you can also guess why Hobbes isn't more explicit about them, because he may think that it's dangerous to talk about this possibility of re defining your terms for different circumstances. Um, okay, so that leaves these two other things that I wanted to talk about. 
And even though the thing about subordinate political structures is really important in a larger context, um, I feel like it's not going to come up so much in this course or in other parts of Hobbes. So, yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, um, Hobbes thinks a commonwealth is a special case of a certain kind of structure, one in which people make a covenant to have one person, that is one individual or assembly, personate them all, um, which again is what we call a corporation. Right? So like a corporation could be a democracy. Um, meaning that like only all the members of the corporation voting together are able to decide what it will do. Um, or it could be a monarchy or an aristocracy. Um, I think just like our commonwealths, our actual corporations are not one of those forms. They're mixed forms. I mean, thinking now of our for-profit corporations, but those are body politics, bodies politic in Hobbes' sense. They, they operate under a state charter. Um, they're, right? So they're, they're really, they're incorporated by the state. They become corporations by being recognized as persons by the state. Um, and here, person means... Right? When people talk about, are corporations persons, or are they people, it seems kind of absurd to say that they are, right? I mean, they're not people like you and me. They're, they're faceless, huge organizations somewhere. But, but, but Hobbes is saying they're persons in the sense that they can take on obligations, and they can commit offenses, and they can be subject to penalties, and so forth. Uh, you know, if you ask them, oh, so do they ha should they have the right to fund political campaigns, he would say, no, no one, there shouldn't be political campaigns and no one should have the right to fund them. So we can't ask him about that. But, um, right, so in any case, um, um, you know, so a commonwealth is a special case of those. It's the one that is in charge of all the others. <laughs> um, but uh, all the others have certain at least the ones that are legal have certain functions to fulfill and he, he discusses what they're good for and what they're not. Um, he doesn't talk a lot about what we mostly think about of when we think about corporations, which is for, for profit corporations, for profit joint stock corporations. There, there just weren't very many in the 17th century and they were mostly of the kind he does discuss. They were for the purposes of monopoly and foreign trade. Right, like the East India Company or whatever. So um, he doesn't seem to think, and even Adam Smith says the same thing. Adam Smith says a joint stock corporation will never be a very good way of, of organizing a business, except in really special circumstances. Um, um, okay, the stuff about public ministers is also interesting, but I don't want to get bogged down in it right now because there's only a few minutes left and I want to talk about that last thing I wrote up, which is economics and equity. I guess I should ask if there are questions either about the propriety of speech or about the um, body's politic that I was just discussing, either about what I said or about things in the reading. Well, there were some questions that I missed. Since there are so many different types of language, does the properness or improperness depend on the language? Well, I mean, yes and no. This is always a question that comes up, right? Obviously, the sounds in different languages will be different. The sounds or the marks. Um, uh, the structure of languages might be different. I don't know how much Hobbes knows about languages with really different structures. Not that much, probably. But he certainly knows Latin is not that similar to English. 
Um, but, um, but when Hobbes is talking about the proper use of words, then presumably he is not interested in those things that are different between different languages. He's interested in certain roles that we need words for, or that we need ways of expressing, and others that we don't want words for, or don't want ways of expressing. And it doesn't matter which word it is. Um, it's interesting. This is the exact same thing that ordinary language philosophers say, or some of them say. Anyway, Gilbert Ryle says this, um, you know, 300 years later, 400 years later. No, wait, 20th century, 300, 300 years later. <laughs> um, that uh, he says, you know, when I talk about the use of the word cause, I don't mean the use of the English word cause as opposed to the use of the German word Ursache. He says, I'm talking about the job that the word cause has in English, which is, the, which is not an English job, but it's a job that you need a word for in every language. You know, whether that's true or not, or whether languages are actually not much more different than that is a good question, but... Um, that's what he's thinking. So I, I hope that answered Vanessa's question. And the other question from Samantha was, so truth arises from the proper use of words. Well, I think what he's saying is more that um, what truths you can derive from the definitions depend on how you use the words. Again, it's always important to remember, even though, like, it's also important to remember why eventually people like, well, people like Kant in particular said that this, you know, this won't work. Um, this kind of, well, I guess not just Kant, Locke, the empiricists, right? Again, this is a rationalist position that somehow from the definition of words, you can get all the truth that you need. Um, but anyway, whether that's workable or not, as, how, as in the way Hobbes understands it, that's that's the way he thinks it works. So, like, um, if you have truths that can be rationally proved, um, then that's going to be because of the definition you started out with. And in that sense, it's the proper way, use of words that makes it, not that makes it true, that it, but it makes it provable as a truth. Um, I mean, it's the same thing that makes it even statable at all as a truth, which is the way it should be for analytic truths, right? Like, you know, if you can say it at all, it's supposed to be evidently true. Did, did that help? You may not be familiar with the term analytic truth, but truth by definition, so to speak, right? Truths by definitions are things, truths by definition are things that the definition of the word that makes it possible to say the thing is also the, um, how you can know the thing is true, right? So like if you say all bodies are extended, and by body you mean an extended substance, then like on the one hand, you couldn't say that statement, all bodies are extended, if you hadn't defined a word to mean extended substance. But also, now that you have defined a word to mean extended substance, you can see right away that everything that that word describes has to be extended. And that's what all truths of reason are like, according to Hobbes. So they depend both for their assertability and for their provability on the proper definition of words. It's not a magic way that redefining words can make certain things true or false. Um, and it doesn't apply to matters of fact, which Hobbes says we can never rationally prove. Right, so I can't make it false that there's a pen here by redefining my words. Um, 
I can't even, in a sense, make it un. I guess I could make it unstatable, but I can't make it unlearnable because you can experience the pen. I think that's right. All right. Oops. So I spent a long time answering those questions, which was good, but I didn't get to talk about. I didn't even get to write economics and equity. Um. Don't remember what it is I'm planning to talk about next time. But if there's time, I will go into that next time because it's kind of important um, on its own, but also because, again, this is an area where Locke and Rousseau and Wollstonecraft are going to disagree with Hobbes about um, the nature of rights to pro uh, property, the uh, role of the government in regulating economic transactions, etc. But I don't think I can do it in two minutes. So I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll find time to talk about that next time. Okay, so I will see you on Thursday then. Bye.